Okay, so uh, Paul Watson, thank you very much for uh, answering uh, to our questions for uh, Le Chou Brave. Um, so I'd like to know, um, so you're a very famous uh, activist for um, the um, uh, sea animals. Uh, I wanted to know if there were moments um, during your childhood or after when you uh, understood um, how fragile the, the nature was or how beautiful it was, if there were some key moments that made you do what you're doing now. Well, I started doing what I was doing when I was 10 years old because I lived in a small fishing village in eastern Canada. And uh, that, when I was 10 that summer, I spent uh, swimming with a family of uh, beavers. And uh, every day I went down there, played with the beavers. And uh, the next uh, summer when I went back, uh, they were all gone. And I began to ask uh, questions and found out that the trappers had come in and killed them all during the winter. So I got pretty angry. So that winter, when I was 11, I began to walk the trap lines and uh, free the animals and destroy the traps. And uh, so I've been doing that ever, ever since, really. Okay. And uh, so you have led many actions for uh, the sea and for also earth uh, animals. Could you tell us which are the greatest actions, the biggest action you have led through the years? I don't really look on them as like one action being more important than the other. I, th I think whether you're protecting uh, phytoplankton or whales, it's you're protecting biodiversity in the ocean. So all of those campaigns are equally important. Uh, so uh, it's hard to really say which one's, you know, bigger or more important really. So which ones were uh, more, more um, significant, significant for you, um, uh, I mean, uh, emotionally or important uh, um, because you have, uh, they had a big impact or I don't know, maybe? Mm. Well, I, I, there's a lot of them. I think that probably the best way is what was the most successful campaigns are, you know, we, we fought the Japanese whalers in the Southern Ocean for 10 years and uh, ended up like last year they killed none, but they're coming back, but we'll keep fighting them. Uh, it took us 35 years to uh, shut down the commercial seal hunt in Canada. It's still a seal hunt, but it's not a commercial seal hunt. Um, so these, you have to have a lot of patience because these campaigns, you know, you don't accomplish anything overnight. We've been fighting the killing of pilot whales in the Faroe Islands since 1983. Uh, la this, this year our biggest success, I mean this last year, was uh, to, we shut down all the uh, illegal fishing vessels in the Southern Ocean. Uh, we chased one for 110 days, it was the longest pursuit of a poacher in history. and. Uh, the captain scuttled his own boat off Santomi to keep us from uh, getting the evidence and arresting him. And uh, so he, he and the two officers were sentenced to prison for that, but uh, we shut down six of the vessels at, the, this last year. And so that cost the, um, the Spanish companies that were behind these illegal operations uh, tens of millions of dollars. Okay. <laughs> and what are the, the priorities, the missions that you are... Um uh, so our two vessels are in the Sea of Cortez protecting the endangered vaquita, which is the smallest and uh, most endangered dolphin in, in the world. Um, we have uh, one vessel in the Mediterranean which will be going against illegal fishing in southern France and also in Sicily uh, in March and, and April. Our Cove Guardians are on the beach in uh, Japan, you know, trying to protect the dolphins from being slaughtered there. And uh, we're sending our vessel, the Bob Barker, to Africa in uh, next month to go against illegal fishing there. Our vessel Steve Irwin's leaving in next week to go uh, pursue uh, illegal activities in the Southern Ocean, that is toothfish poaching and illegal whaling by, by Japan. We have, we're working in partnership with Biosphera, which is an organization, Cape Verde, to stop poaching in, in that country. And uh, well, we have so many campaigns, it's hard to really keep up with it. But we have nine ships uh, all, all together and uh, hundreds of volunteers working at any given time. One of the priorities would be protecting the endangered species and... Well, we, well what we do is really a focus on illegal activities. Illegal fishing, illegal killing of whales, illegal sealing. Uh, you know, 40% of all of the fish that's taken out of the ocean that people buy in restaurants or in stores is caught illegally. And uh, so that's a significant factor shutting that down. So, you know, although we're opposed to all fishing, all commercial fishing, uh, we concentrate on the illegal activities because that allows us to be successful because we're really upholding the laws and, and you know, have that sort of backing behind us. And that keeps, it keeps us pretty busy in itself. And do you feel things are evolving in the right way? 
Well, I think as far as uh, you know, people becoming more aware of things, yes. Uh, you know, people are much more aware now than they were 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. That's a it's a growing, a growing movement in that way. Uh, are we evolving fast enough? I don't know. Uh, time will tell. Um, I think we have some very serious situations uh, that that, are, that we have to deal with right now. One of the fact is that uh, this planet was never made for 7.5 billion. Uh, plant, uh, you know, uh, fish and meat-eating uh, primates. It just wasn't meant for it. And uh, we're literally eating the ocean alive. And um, even when people eat meat, they're eating the ocean because 40% of all of the fish caught from the ocean is fed to pigs and chickens and uh, domestic salmon to house cats. So we're, we're living in a world right now where pigs are eating more fish than all the world's sharks and uh, chickens in Europe alone are eating more fish than all the world's puffins and albatross and domestic house cats eat more fish than seals so it's a you know it's a bizarre situation where the largest aquatic predators on the planet are chickens pigs and uh, and domestic house cats so should you think uh, um, uh, one of the solutions could be of the solutions yeah could be go, um, people going um, closer to vegeta uh, vegetarianism or do you think that no, it would be a solution? No, it's not one of the solutions, it's the only solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the world has to adapt to a plant-based diet or else we're not going to survive. We're killing 65 billion animals every year and that's producing more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation industry. Mm -hmm. The world transportation industry produces 14% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the animal uh, agricultural industry is 24%, so it's 10% even more. So, uh, you know, I always like to say that, uh, um, you know, a, a vegan, driving a Hummer contributes less to greenhouse gas production than a meat eater riding a bicycle. Oh. <laughs> That's significant. Yeah, so you're a vegan, of course. How long have you been? How, di how did it, uh, uh, did, were you always a vegan? And how, is it, how difficult is it for you on a day-to-day -day basis in this actual world to be a vegan? Okay. In, in 1979, uh, our ships, that's when we first started getting our ships, uh, I had left Greenpeace and we set up Sea Shepherd. Uh, in 1979, our ships were vegetarian vessels. And uh, we switched to vegan vessels in 1999. So they've been vegan ever since. So all of our vessels are vegan. Now people don't have to be vegan to crew on the ships, but they have to be vegan while they're on the ships. And it actually gives a, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, an, an experience that uh, this is a way I think is the best way to teach people you know instead of like proselytizing or preaching just show them the experience if you're on a ship eating uh, vegan meals for two three months then it's amazing how many people adapt to it and uh, and accept it as, as normal uh, without it being bullied into it so it's, it works quite well uh, you know it's a lot easier now to find vegan places uh, anywhere than it was you know 30 years ago 20 years ago certainly 10 years ago um, so it's uh, it's not that difficult really I feel like it's a topic you must be taught of because uh, you need to know which vegetables uh, c contain um, more proteins or fibers and don't you think I don't even worry about that I you just don't? I just eat the vegetables, I eat the fruit, I don't care, you know. Your body pretty much tells you what to, what to eat, you know. I don't really get into all the uh, breakdowns of this and that, you know. I always find that your body uh, has a craving for this or that, and, you know, and you go for it. Uh, it's, like, it's what you restrict yourself on that you have to be aware of, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat that. And then the rest of the stuff, well, you got sort of a desire to eat that or a desire to eat this. Uh, so. You know, it's not to me. It's not a priority sort of thing. What I eat, uh, the priority is that I eat, and not contribute to the destruction of the planet by by doing it. Hmm. I think there is more uh, disease from eating meat than from. I mean, people who eat oh, yeah. meat are more more sick than people who don't. Well, certainly, it's not healthy. Hmm. Uh, I've always found it funny that if you look at any of the um, science fiction TV shows or everything, the future is vegan. You know, Star Trek, they're all vegans, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, that's where it's going, and everybody knows that. You know, I've talked to a lot of chefs who actually um, are well aware of that, that they know that that's where it's going to towards. And you see that trend. It's about growing. It's an, evolving, it's an evolving trend. People are becoming more and more aware. Uh, McDonald's is in serious uh, financial difficulties right now, uh, and, uh, you know, 20 years ago, nobody could imagine that would happen. 
uh, you're finding that uh, the demand for meat is down considerably uh, every year, more than the year before. So in that way, it's a, it's a growing movement that's been very, very successful in getting that, getting that word across. You know, just recently, uh, just yesterday actually, there was a, a commercial in Australia that put out by the lamb in the sheep industry, the lamb industry, which is very uh, antagonistic towards vegans. It was actually very violent towards vegans, you know, because this guy says, I'm a vegan, and they like put a, blow, a flamethrower and destroy his, uh, his property. And of course, all the vegans in Australia got really upset about it. And I said, no, you got to look at the positive side of that. The positive side is they see you as a threat, mm -hmm. and uh, they're recognizing that. So, you know. Let them do that. Uh, you know, uh, a million and a half people in Australia saw that advertisement, and what are they going to remember? That these people were being violently abusive towards vegans, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that you know, most of them didn't even know what a vegan was. You know. <laughs> yeah, they don't even have uh, arguments, or uh, there's nothing to say against veganism. I mean. Well, you know, people always find something to say against anybody for any reason. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, you know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if Jesus Christ came back, they'd probably accuse him of this, that, or the other. You know, nobody's perfect. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you can't satisfy everybody. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> and um, I know many people who are already vegan and who uh, recycle. And what would you advise for peop those people who already do many things, but who want to go um, even further, do more things? What, what are the most significant things to change, to make a real change? I think that everybody has to look at what kind of uh, footprint they're leaving on the planet. You know, everything that you do contributes, uh, you know, how does it contribute to making this planet either a better place to live for the future or not a very good place to live for the future. That, so that's really how you look at it. Um, you know, our ships fly the flag of the five nation, the, the Iroquois, the Iroquois Confederacy. And the reason they gave us the flag, and we're the only ships that fly that, uh, is because the, com the Iroquois Confederacy and Sea Shepherd have a, a mutual understanding, and that is that uh, we both agree that you shouldn't make any decision in your life until you take into account the consequences of that decision on all future generations. And that, I think, is the way we have to, to live our life. When you do something, well, what is this going to mean for the future? Uh, it really comes down to two ways of thinking. One is what we all used to be, which is of a biocentric point of view and one is what most people are now, an anthropocentric point of view. The biocentric point of view is that we're part of nature. The anthropocentric point of view is we're in charge of nature, we're the only important thing, everything revolves around us. And uh, only indigenous cultures still retain that biocentric point of view. And, but there's also this thing called the continuum, and that is the continuum of time. For instance, if you ask your average person in Europe or America or whatever, you just say, what was your great, 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 great grandmother's name? The year's 1500, what was her name? What'd she do? They don't know, they don't care. I mean, what's that, what's that gotta do with anything? You know, that's their attitude. But if you go to the outback of Australia and you ask an Aboriginal that question, or you go into the Amazon rainforest and ask a Kayapo Indian that question, you'll get a name and you'll get details about the person's life because these are people who knew where they came from. And because they know where they came from, they know who they are, and because they know who they are, they know where they're going, so that means a child born 500 years into the future is very much a part of their reality now. Uh, our society doesn't think like that at all. We don't really think about what kind of future we're leaving to children tomorrow. We don't even, we forget about what happened in the past, and because we have no past and we have no vision, we don't even know where we are today. Also, I think there's less and, pe less, and less people who are who have a spirituality, who uh, believe in there is more to us than just a short uh, period of time on this earth. Um, are you spiritual? Do you believe that uh, there is more to life than just... No. I don't really think it's anything that we should even worry about. Uh, Gertrude Stein once said, the answer is, there is no answer. That's the only answer you're ever going to get. So why are we wasting our time fighting each over, other over who's, uh, who's right and who's wrong? Nobody knows what, what the reality is. Uh, what we do know is that uh, all the religions in the world are anthropocentric religions. They all revolve around humanity. And God is a human being, or humans are God, or whatever. God's made in our image. Basically, we just created all of this. You know, so uh, to me, religion is just everybody fighting over who's got the better imaginary friend. You know, <laughs> uh, but uh, spiritually, uh, I, I, I believe in the laws of ecology. I believe that uh, the earth is a living entity, that uh, all things 
uh, re required biodiversity, that every living system has that biodiversity, and within that biodiversity you have interdependence, the law of interdependence, that all of those species are interdependent with each other. And then, of course, the third law of ecology is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity, and we're stealing the carrying capacity of other species so that we can increase the numbers of our own species, which doesn't make any sense. I mean, people get upset when I say things like worms and bees and trees are more important than people. And the reason I say that worms and bees and trees are more important than people is simply because worms and bees and trees are more important than people. Because for the simple reason, they can live on the planet without us, but we can't live without them. So uh, that makes them more important than we are. Hmm. There's a, yeah, that's what I meant by um, spirituality, not religion, but I mean, believing in something greater and believe also, believing also in what the physicians are proving uh, on um, quantum physics, for example. I don't know if you've heard of Nassim Haramein, who discovered that, who, uh, yeah, he thinks that everything is connected. And when you believe this, I think, or when you're interested in this, you understand that what you do has an impact on everything, also by the laws of physics. But, yeah, well, what you think, what you do, how you behave, and what emotions you... Well, the three laws of ecology are the law of diversity, the law of interdependence, and the law of finite resources. So it basically says the, says the same thing from an ecological point of view, that, uh, that we need that interdependence. The problem right now is that we're uh, destroying interdependence because we're destroying diversity. And that means that right now we're in the sixth major extinction in the planet's history, the last one being 65.2 million years ago. And uh, this one, we're the reason for it, we're, we're, we're the cause of it. But uh, I don't really get depressed because I do know that uh, it takes 18 to 20 million years to recover from a major extinction event. So 18 to 20 million years uh, from now, this will be a really nice place. <laughs> and you've still got, what, what still gives you the energy to continue this fight, seeing what human being does? In 1973, I was a, a medic for the, uh, the American Indian movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. Uh, we had seized uh, the community uh, to protest the uh, fact that the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 was being you know, ignored by the U.S. government. The U.S. government responded by surrounding us with about 2,000 troops. They were firing 20,000 rounds a night at us. Uh, it was uh, you know, a, a very, very dangerous situation. They, they killed two Indians and wounded 46. And I asked uh, Russell Means, who was the American Indian Movement leader at the time, I said, uh, you know, we don't have any hope of winning here, so why are we doing this? And he said, well, we don't do what we do because we're concerned about winning or losing. And we're not concerned about the odds against us. We do what we do because it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. And uh, that's why we're here. So I've what I learned from that is that you don't focus on the consequences. You focus on the doing. And uh, so that's what we do. We, we intervene and we don't worry about whether we're going to win or lose. We just have to do our part. And can you tell us about uh, the books, um, your new books? Yeah, I, um, when the climate change conference happened, you know, for instance, first of all, I attended the United Nations conference on the environment in 1972 in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And at that conference, the number one thing on the agenda was uh, out of control human population growth and how it had to be addressed. Well, 20 years later, I, I attended the United Nations conference on the environment and development, they added that word development to it, in Rio de Janeiro. And the population issue was no longer on the agenda. Nobody was talking about it. It was completely ignored. So it went from the priority issue in 72 to not existing at all in 92. And none of the uh, programs, suggestions, ideas that came out of either of those conferences was ever implemented. Total failures. Every climate change conference that we've had since then is total failure. So this one that just happened in Paris, total failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, basically, they. Uh, I mean, they are all patting themselves on the back on it, but what does it say? Nothing. Uh, it isn't even ratified till 2020. Uh, it mentions the ocean once, and we had to force it in to get it in there. It doesn't talk about fossil fuels. It doesn't talk. It doesn't mention coal or oil once. Um, basically, and, it, and the most important part about it, it's non-binding, mm -hmm. so nobody has to do anything. Uh, so this is the way it always goes. So I wrote this book here called "Solutions to Climate Change That Nobody Wants to Hear." and there are real solutions. It's a serious situation. It requires a serious uh, solutions. 
And the first solution is we have to allow the ocean to repair itself. The ocean is the life support system of the planet. Uh, without the ocean, we don't exist. The ocean dies, we die. It all starts with a tiny little microscopic phytoplankton in the ocean. They provide over 60% of the oxygen that we breathe. And uh, that supports the zooplankton, which supports the fish, which supports the whales, and then the whales support the phytoplankton. It's a, it's a circle because every day, one blue whale drops three tons of manure into the ocean that's rich in nitrogen, rich in iron, and that's the nutrient base for the phytoplankton. So it's a beautiful system. It's worked for millions of years, and we've totally disrupted that system. Look at it this way. If the Earth is a spaceship traveling through space, which is what it is, the uh, biodiversity is the life support system. It provides the oxygen, it provides the food, it provide, regulates climate, regulates temperature, and that life support system is run by a crew, a crew of Earthlings. And that crew is not humans. Uh, humans are uh, passengers. We're having a great time entertaining ourselves, but we don't run the ship. Um, but what we are doing is killing the crew members. And there's only so many crew members you kill before the whole thing begins to collapse. And, and that, so that's what's happening right now. So we need to give the ocean a chance to revive. Now, example, in Polynesia for, you know, thousands of years, um, there was a concept called taboo. The uh, shaman would say, this area is taboo like a bay. No fishing for 20 years. And they were very serious about it. You caught a fish there, it was a death penalty. You did not touch those fish. Because they understood that their survival depended upon, you know, having uh, that biodiversity there. And uh, so there's no taboo areas in the world anymore. Everything is being uh, exploited everywhere. Even the marine reserves, that's where the poachers go because, you know, they've killed everything, everything, everywhere else. So we have to allow the ocean to regenerate. How do we do that? The governments, what they need to do is stop all subsidies on industrial fishing. We spend 75 to 100 billion dollars a year subsidizing industrial fishing. Shut that down and you'll shut down most of that industrial fishing. And the reason why they do this is because things have changed over the last 50, 60 years. The little fishing town I was raised in, small fishing boats went out there causing enough destruction by themselves. But the problem is, is that there's not enough fish for them to do that anymore. We've removed 90% of the commercial fisheries during the, the 20th century. In order to get that last 10%, you need heavy equipment. 100 mile long gill nets, 100 mile long long lines, uh, super trawlers, giant purse saners, bottom draggers. These boats cost anywhere from 100 to 150 million euros each. You know, you can't, nobody can afford that unless you get subsidies from the government. So the government is basically, the governments are basically subsidizing the destruction of the oceans. We have to shut down industrialized fishing operations. And if we do, the ocean will revive. Uh, just look at the 20th century as a good example. The two times during the 20th century that the ocean recovered slightly, World War I and World War II, when we stopped fishing for five year periods. And they started to come up and then we knocked it down again. So I believe that in 40 to 50 years, if we leave the ocean alone, it will uh, revitalize itself. The second solution is that uh, we have to switch to a plant-based diet worldwide. Uh, how that's going to be done, I don't know, but it's the only way I think that we're going to be able to, to survive. But we, we just cannot continue to kill 65 billion animals every year, and we can't, uh, just simply cannot afford, the, ecologically, we cannot afford to have this kind of lifestyle, uh, aside from the, um, the ethical issues involved. It's the ecological issues which are going to uh, destroy us on this. Uh, the third solution, again, is one that isn't very, you know, is simple to me, but unacceptable to most, and that is shut down all military operations in the world, get rid of it, all the armaments. You know, we, we spend enough money on so-called defense every year to provide every man, woman, and child on this planet with medical care, water, and food, and shelter. Every single person could be provided uh, that if we just took away that military budget, which is it's just obscene. Uh, and for, there wouldn't be any need for war if everybody in the world was given a guaranteed annual income. And we can afford to give everybody a guaranteed annual income by simply not having a military. But uh, the problem is, is human beings are ecologically insane. And uh, it's, it's a disease which has afflicted them emotionally, spiritually, and uh, it's a, a form of, um, I don't know, 
it's a psychopathic sort of situation. And uh, I don't sure really we, that can be remedied other than the extinction of the human species. You know, I, I came to this realization in 1975. Uh, we came up with this idea to save whales in the Pacific uh, from the Russian whalers. And uh, our idea was to uh, get between the harpoons and the whales and uh, put our lives on the line to protect them. We were re reading a lot of Gandhi at the time and we figured that, you know, that's going to work. So in June of 1975, uh, Bob Hunter and I were in a small little boat in front of a Russian whaling vessel was coming down at us full speed and in front of us were eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life and every time the harpooner tried to get a shot I would maneuver the boat and block his harpoon. And that worked for about 20 minutes until the captain on the boat came down the gangway and he, he screamed into the ear of the harpooner then he looked at us and he went like this and smiled and that's when we realized Gandhi wasn't going to work for us that day and a few moments later the harpoon, there was an explosion, the harpoon flew over her head, hit one of the whales in the back and she screamed and rolled on her side, blood everywhere and the largest whale in the pod suddenly hit the water with his tail, dove and swam right underneath of us and threw himself right at the bow of the Russian boat to protect his pod and they were ready with an unattached harpoon and they shot a harpoon at point blank range into his head. He fell back screaming and rolling in agony on the surface, blood everywhere. And that's when I caught his eye. And he looked at me. He dove and I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight at us real fast. And he came up and at us at an angle so the next move was to come right down on top of us. <clears throat> and as his head came up out of the water and I looked into his eye, that really changed my life. Because what I saw was understanding that the whale understood what we were trying to do because I could see the effort he made to pull himself back and he began to sink back into the sea and I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface and he died. Uh, he could have killed us and uh, he chose not to do so. So I owe my life to that whale. But as I sat there and the sun was going down and in the middle of the Russian whaling fleet, I began to think, why? Why were the Russians killing these whales? You, could, you don't eat sperm whales. Uh, they're unedible because of the high uh, concentration of um, myoglobin in the, in the flesh, which, uh, because they're deep diving whales, so the meat is a blackish meat. On the, uh, but what they do is they make sperm oil out of the, out of the meat and spermaceti oil out of the reservoir of spermaceti oil in the head. And that's a very uh, high heat resistant oil, which is used in industry. And one of the things that it was most in demand for was for the construction of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said, here we are killing this beautiful, intelligent, socially aware, uh, socially complex, self-aware, sentient being for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me. I said, we're, we're insane. We're totally insane. And uh, that's when I said to myself, uh, I'm not here to work for people anymore. I'm here to work for whales and fish and sharks and whatever. But, uh, you know, when people say, well, you know, how come you don't protect people? Because we're crazy. They're not worthy. You know? Yeah, we were just completely crazy. And uh, the fact is, is that <laughs> I was a director, a national director of the Sierra Club in the United States for three years from 2003 to 2006. And this is a, the oldest conservation organization in America. And there's 15 directors on that and we meet four times a year. And at one of the meetings, they brought in all of these people from the, the, the inner city and the barrios, you know, the poor areas in there to lecture on us, us on what we should be doing, that our priorities should be helping people, not helping animals. And I got really angry, you know, because I just said to them, I said, look, you know, 99 cents out of every charitable dollar goes to people. Keep your goddamn greedy hands off our penny, you know. So, and the guy says, you're calling me a, you're a racist. I said, don't call me a racist. I, I'm a misanthrope. I, I dislike everybody equally. I do not make a distinguish <laughs> on this thing. But I tell you, all the money goes to people, you know, and nothing goes to the environment in comparison to that. So I, you know, I said, don't give me this crap about how, you know, you know, you guys need, the priorities have to go to you. Because as environmentalists, as conservationists, we're actually doing more for the future of your children than you are. Because they're not gonna have a planet unless we intervene. So what can you say to, the last thing you could say to people who would be, who will be, will be watching this video when they close down their computer, what should they do right now to change things? What do you advise people to? I think that's an individual decision that people have to do what they do use, using their skills, their abilities, their talents, uh, and to follow their own passion. 
what is it that people are passionate about? Uh, individuals can change the world. Uh, so I always just encourage people to follow that passion. For instance, Diane Fossey, because she lived, mountain gorillas were protected. Bruti Geldikas, her work with orangutans, uh, Jane Goodall, uh, David Wingate, David Wingate, because of this one man who lived in Bermuda, the Bermuda storm, Petro, is not extinct. I mean, how much more noble a legacy can you leave than the fact that you lived and a species was prevented from going extinct or a habitat was protected? And, and all of this work is being done by individuals, by passionate individuals. So I just encourage people to, uh, to work on three virtues, their passion and harness that passion to courage and imagination and then everybody can make a difference. And it doesn't matter what you, what you, how you approach it. It could be litigation, legislation, education, direct action. If you're a lawyer, or if you're a teacher, if you're a writer, if you're a filmmaker, if you're whatever, as long as you use those, those abilities to make this a better world for the, the future. Because we all can't do the same thing because the strength of an ecosystem is in diversity. The strength of a movement is in diversity. So everybody has to understand that we can't all do the same thing. You know, I see this in this movement all the time. I get you know people criticizing this group for doing this and criticizing group, this group for, you know, this isn't the way to do it, you gotta do it this way. Well, what people should do is do it your way and let them do it their way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's all towards the same end anyway and stop arguing over your tactics and your strategies. Yeah. So what do you think we, could, we should teach our children? So I'm always asked this question, well, what we can teach our children? And my answer to that is nothing. Absolutely nothing. What we need to do is listen to them because children intuitively know where they belong. You know, look at a, your average six-year-old. I mean, they know more about most things than average adults. You know, when I was six years old, I was into dinosaurs and birds and whales and everything like this. And I always had adults telling me not to do this or not to do that or not to think this way or not to think that way. And, uh, you know, th this is what adults tend to do is tell their children what not to do when they should be encouraged them, their passion. Um, back in the 70s, we gave a series of three talks in the Queen Charlotte Islands, which is a Haida Indian Reservoir, Reserve. And uh, the first was to kindergarten, the second was to middle school, and the third was to seniors. And uh, so, went to the kindergarten first. And the first, we had two questions. The first one, how many people here speak Haida? Every kid there spoke the Haida language, six years old. How many people here know about whales? Didn't have to say a thing, just listen to the kids tell us about whales. By the time we got to middle school, half of them spoke Haida, half of them knew about whales. By the time we got to the seniors, not one of them spoke the Haida language, and uh, their attitude on whales was, who cares? So what we did was we took all these beautiful, beautiful, intelligent kids and turned them into complete idiots through our educational system. And this is what our educational systems do. They tell people not to think. They tell people how to behave, you know, what to believe, how to go about things. And uh, we really need to listen to children and not tell them, tell them what to do. I mean, my daughter, for example, I sort of experimented with her on that and it turned out perfectly. And I just said when she was seven years old, I said, you know, Lanny, I said, I'm not your boss. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I says, I'll encourage you and I'll support you in whatever you want to do, but you're, you make your own decisions in your life. Whatever you want to be, you can be. And, uh, and, and she did that. She followed what she wanted to do and uh, you know, never had any problems with her at all. <laughs> you know? So it's because uh, I, I think you give the, if you give the children the freedom to be themselves, then you're going to have a, a, healthy, a healthy child. There's a new um, education system which is called unschooling. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, on, it's simply uh, not putting uh, uh, kids at school, but letting them get interested in what they want to be, what, what to learn. And it says that children naturally want to learn everything. They, they don't especially like math. Or they like everything. So if you just let them uh, teach themselves and ask us questions, they will naturally do their own education. Right. So I thought it was very, very intelligent. Um. And also, you know, when it, came, it comes to uh, vegetarianism, veganism, it's, uh, you know, the kids naturally, you know, don't, you know, if you show them, If you show them an apple and you show them a chicken and you ask you to eat one of them, they're not going to eat the chicken. You know? They're not going to kill the chicken. No, they're not going <laughs> to. You know? So we, well, what we also do in our educational systems is we divorce the reality of the situation from, the, from what it is. This is not a chicken. What you get in the store, 
that's different than what this is. And, th and so we try, we separate reality for them and it's, uh, it's a very, very dangerous thing. You know, I always get this other thing too, is people say, well, I'm not gonna have any children because, you know, the world's overpopulated and, uh, you know, I'm not gonna contribute to that. Well, if you're smart enough to think that, then you're the people who should be having children. Because uh, for every person who thinks that, there's 99 who just doesn't, they don't give a damn. And they're the ones who bring up the children who don't give a damn either. You know, I asked this fisherman in Alaska one time, I said, for no other reason uh, than anything else, save the fish so that your children can be part of your fishing industry or whatever. And his answer to me really illustrated the problem. He said, ah, you know, uh, my mortgage is paid in five years. After that, I couldn't give a damn. I said, so what do you have kids for? Well, it's sort of what you do, isn't it? You know, you know, they don't really, a lot of people have children not even knowing why. It's just sort of what's expected of them. And that because it's what's expected of them, they, it's, there's no real imagination put into, into how they're raised and everything. In fact, they become more of a problem and a nuisance to them in their lives and, than anything else. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.